Welcome back to Unremarkable Labs. I'm excited to have another collaborative episode with WashU and the Unremarkable Labs team at UAB. Um, tonight, we have a great case with one of our WashU PGY3s, Nick Koenig. Um, he'll be discussing a hematology case to Dr. Sana Seif from the hematology division. She's actually associate program director for the fellowship. Um, and having worked with her on service, I am excited to learn all the pearls that I've probably forgotten since the last time we <laughs> rounded together. Let me share. Let me share my screen, and we'll get started. Okay. Okay. What's the chief concern? What do we got going on? Uh, do you want the, the full one liner or just the chief concern? Uh, just the chief concern. All right. So, um, subacute failure to thrive and progressive altered mental status. If it's okay to have two. Yeah, that works. Why don't you? give us some more details. So uh, the patient is a 61 year old male. Uh, he has a past history of alcohol use disorder, uh, half ref, AFib, and aortic regurgitation with uh, well, status post bioprosthetic AVR. And that was done uh, like five years prior to presentation. Okay. All right. And then um, more HBI. Yeah, go for it. All right. So the, the patient was altered enough that he wasn't really able to provide uh, much history up front. Uh, so the majority of this was obtained from collateral. Uh, but essentially, the patient was in his usual state of health until around two weeks prior to his presentation. Uh, over the course of the past two weeks, he was noted to have some episodic abdominal pain that did not have any relationship to food intake, uh, no noted nausea, vomiting, uh, or bowel symptoms, but this collateral was obtained from a friend, uh, so it's possible that we, we may have missed some other symptoms. Um, the only other uh, specific symptom uh, on our initial review of systems that was noted uh, with, with the collateral source was an episode of altered breathing, um, which seemed self-limited. Um, it, it, it was just described as the patient breathing hard. Uh, he became progressively more confused at home, uh, was previously able to do his ADLs, but over the course of the two weeks prior to presentation, uh, became unable to really ambulate, bathe, or feed himself with assistance from his friend, and then become incontinent of, of urine. Um, there were no other localizing symptoms noted, uh, and then further history from the patient was unable to be obtained due to the patient's mental status. Okay, well, uh, giving us a lot of information at once, but Unfortunately, with the patient status, we're not really able to get a lot of specifics. Um, Dr. Centaur, do you want to describe a little bit of how you think about failure to thrive? Since this is such a big topic, mm -hmm. I think we see a lot of patients admitted with this being the chief concern. Yeah, fa fa failure to thrive is always interesting, um, especially when you can't get a history. And so mm -hmm. you do a physical exam, uh, and you get some basic labs uh, and hope that the basic labs give you a clue. Um, and, and uh, you know, it can, it can be uh, uh, an early sign of dementia. It can be uh, a complication of a cancer. Um, uh, it, it could be an autoimmune disease. And so, I mean, it could be so many different things that with the lack of much history, now we have to we have to spend a lot of time worrying about what's going on with that heart, and uh, I'll be very interested to see what medications uh, he's on. Uh, but I think the the labs really might help us. You know, he's got mm -hmm. AFib, so he's probably anticoagulated. 
so we're gonna that ought to be interesting. It'll be interesting to see if he's on all the right medicines. He easily could have metabolic reasons mm -hmm. if he's on diuretics, especially if they don't know how to use the diuretics. Um, you know, it could be uh, elder abuse. Um, we don't know who takes care of him. It'd be nice to know. This is where the true social history, not the behavioral history, but the social history can be very valuable. Um, that's a pretty good ramble. Yeah. Um, Dr. Saif, do you, in your practice with hematology and in oncology, I'm sure you see failure to thrive a lot, but when you combine that with altered mental status, are there conditions that you think of? I guess uh, from like hematology perspective, it's too broad, right? I mean, again, I even I would think more of like a metabolic cause first before kind of like thinking of like a widespread malignancy um, causing all this. So, so again, it doesn't look like there is a localizing sign, you know, blood in the stool or shortness of breath or something to suggest that, um, you know, there is a kind of a metastatic malignancy there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's too broad of a category, I would say, if we are to think about hemog. But yeah, unfortunately, my life is numbers. So I'm like, oh, what are the labs? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nick, was there anything else on the review of systems or, uh, or like collateral information that you can give us? Or was that about it? That was about it, unfortunately, for, for the initial barrage here. Oh, quick question. You said a history of alcohol use. Uh, what does that mean? Recent, remote, still using? As as far as we know, um, he the, the we had a note from an office visit prior to this presentation that indicated the patient had said he had stopped drinking a mm -hmm. couple months prior, um, but had prolonged around six ounces daily of liquor um, mm -hmm. up until that point. And then for what it's worth, the uh, serum ethanol was negative uh, mm -hmm. in the ED. You're giving away stuff early. <laughs> why, don't uh, we, why don't we, now you're good. Why don't we get a little bit more past medical if there's anything else to add and then walk through his meds and the rest. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, additional, I think a, a number of these were, were in the one-liner, um, but hypertension, Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction um, with the last EF of 30 to 35 percent based on an echo uh, around a month prior to presentation, um, which also, also actually noted uh, grade three diastolic dysfunction. Mm -hmm. um, the atrial fibrillation I mentioned, um, chronic low back pain, CKD with a baseline creatinine of around 2.0 and then COPD. Mm -hmm. uh, the medications, the patient was on uh, albuterol, aspirin, atorvastatin, uh, Advair, or I'm sorry, uh, fluticasone, salmeterol, uh, folic acid supplement. Am I going too fast, Mohit? No, no, you're doing you're good. Right. You're good. Um, hydralazine, Isterdil, Oh. metoprolol and uh, teotropium. Were any of those medications new or have they just kind of been stable there? Those uh, were all stable as far as I could tell. Also of note uh, to Dr. Centaur's question, um, he was supposed to have been on Eliquis or um, Apixaban, but was uh, only prescribed a short course and unfortunately did not make it. He, I think he got around a month from a prior provider and did not make it to the follow-up at which the uh, um, Apixaban was planning to get refilled. Uh, so he was unfortunately not anticoagulated um, at the time. And then also of note, he had previously been on uh, lisinopril and baclofen, as well as Lasix and gabapentin, all have which all of which have been held uh, for worsening renal function uh, prior to admission. Um, his past surgical history was notable for uh, the aortic valve replacement uh, with bi bioprosthesis. Um, there, it was also noted uh, a 
left ventricular outflow tract reconstruction um, at the time of that. So that was actually his third valve surgery. Um, so there was a, a little bit more of a uh, intensive procedure associated with that third valve replacement. Um, and then the social history. Uh, so we mentioned the, the alcohol use as, as far as we could tell, uh, had not been drinking for around two to three months prior to presentation. He did have a history of marijuana use and then um, previous uh, urine drug screens that were notable for positive uh, opioids and amphetamines, uh, but the patient denied use. There was a 44 and had denied use, I'm sorry, prior, uh, prior to this hospitalization. He had a 44 pack year history of smoking. Um, and I did not write down, I'm sorry, that how I believe he was still an active smoker. I'm not sure how many packs a day he was smoking at the time of his uh, presentation. Sure. Uh, and he was uh, divorced, living alone in an apartment with uh, support from his friend. Okay. Any, any relevant family history? Uh, there, there was a stroke in his mom, um, and then he noted hypertension and diabetes and other family members, but we don't know who those were, um, and then no allergies. Okay. Um, so for me, the only thing that really I can grab at is his cardiac history. <laughs> and failure to thrive may be indicative of you know, worsening cardiac function, which can then lead to global hypoperfusion, which then leads to failure to thrive. Um, the altered mental status, regardless of the time course, could then be something that could make me think about like a shock physiology where he's just having global hypoperfusion. Um, but other than that, you know, even the medications don't guide me a whole lot, uh, especially since it seems like appropriate medications were held when they should have been. I don't know, mm -hmm. Dr. Seif, we haven't gotten to numbers yet, but if the background of this patient has aided in your thought process at all. Yeah, no, I, I agree that, you know, it's it's more cardiac uh, kind of. So so he had the valve replacement and it was a bioprosthetic. Well, Correct. I guess, okay. Yeah, and it sounds like it's functioning okay. Like there's no regurg or something like that that they noted on the echo. Correct. Yeah. Why yeah. did you ask about that? Was there is there something that comes? I don't know if you know. So we talk about mechanical hemolysis. I don't know what his labs would look like, but um, there is a misconception that you know the the valve associated hemolysis happens in stenosis, which is not the case. It's actually seen in really bad regurgitation, which can be the native valve or the replaced valve. So. So just like, you know, I don't know what his labs look like, but but um, if you are seeing significant regurgitation, we we usually just support the patients with um, folic acid and iron because they will continuously lack kind of a hemolysis picture. And there are situations where the surgeons cannot go in and replace or fix the problem. So it's just kind of like a, you know, hey, we'll just give you enough so that you just keep on making the red blood cells, but you will constantly hemolyze them. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Dr. Um, Centaur, are you looking at the chat? Is anything interesting popping up? Uh, well, we had a very nice discussion of Mark your father, big NAMI. <laughs> that, it was, that was one of the diagnoses considered in my CPC today. Huh. I'm, I'm not familiar. I, I, don't, I don't even know if I understood the words that came out of your mouth. Uh, okay, well, it's, uh, you just took boards. I figured you'd know that. <laughs> they ask very simple things, I'm telling you. So you, you don't know about March, your father, Big Nami? That's all. like my new thing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to the physical exam. Yeah. Wait, and, and, you know, we need to get, this is unremarkable lab, so we probably ought to get to the labs. Yeah, I think so. so let's do the physical exam first. Yeah, let's go for it. So, yeah, I think the labs will probably propel the sort of the meat of the discussion. So I will quickly get through the exam here. But the vitals were notable for a temperature of 33 degrees uh, Celsius. His blood pressure was 136 over 95. Heart rate was 80. Respiratory rate was 10. 
and he was setting 95% on two liters uh, on clear. One of my pet peeves, one of my pet peeves, oh, this no. guy has atrial fibrillation. Was it, was the 80 regular or irregularly irregular? Is he always in AFib or is he going in and out of AFib? It was irregularly irregular. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the remainder, remainder of the exam, uh, in general, the patient was cachectic appearing. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, his BMI was uh, 14. Um, so he, he was cachectic appearing. Um, the um, cardiovascular exam was, uh, as mentioned, the uh, rhythm was ir irregularly irregular. Um, and S3 was heard. Uh, no other uh, murmur was commented on uh, initially. Uh, the uh, the cardiac exam was also notable for, and I guess the, the neck exam was notable for a JVD to the angle of the mandible uh, at 30 degrees on presentation. Um, his lungs sounded coarse, but no specific wheezing, no lo localization of any lung findings. Um, his abdomen was soft, non-tender, non non-distended. Uh, the extremities were notable for two plus uh, pitting edema to the knee uh, bilaterally, uh, and then his pulses were somewhat difficult to palpate. Um, radial pulses were one plus bilaterally. Uh, neuro exam, he localized to noxious stimuli, uh, would open his eyes and move uh, with stimulation, with touch, but not to voice, um, was not oriented at all, would not follow commands. Uh, we did not do a uh, reflex exam initially. Um, and then the skin exam, uh, the patient's an African-American uh, male, but no uh, purpur petechia were, were appreciated. Um, so do you want me to just jump right into labs here, Mohit? Or anyone want to comment on the, the physical exam there? Yeah, I mean, I don't think the exam guides us a whole lot besides quantifying a little bit his like neuropsych exam that he is truly mm -hmm. altered. It's not just a subjective thing. Um, but it seems pretty nonspecific. I, maybe I didn't catch it, but his cranial nerves were intact, or was that difficult to get? Uh, to the extent that he could cooperate with exam, which wasn't much, uh, there were no, yeah, no deficits were noted. Yeah, and this is one of those where sometimes diagnosis has to take the, the back burner and you have to treat the patient first. So if there were signs of any respiratory compromise or he was too obtunded to you know, protect his airway, we are starting to think about ABCs in the emergency room needing whether he needs intubation or not and, and needs higher level of care. But it sounds like we need to get into the laboratory work to find out what's going on with him. So why don't we start That's with good. the uh, sodium was 147. Uh, potassium was 7.8. Oh. Uh, chloride was 115. Bicarb was 15. BUN was 184, and that was that was from uh, 50 one month prior. Creatinine was 6.1 uh, from 2.5 around one month prior. His baseline was thought to be around two, and then his uh, blood glucose was 93. Okay. CBC, uh, his hemoglobin on presentation was 10.6. Uh, with an MCV of 96. Um, his platelets were 32. Okay. And his white count was 2.2 with 49% neutrophils, 29% uh, lymphocytes, 21% monocytes. Retix, I see in the chat. Um, well, yeah, can I, should I start jumping to other potentially pertinent labs here? Yeah, can you just go through the diff one more time? Yeah, sorry. 49% uh, neutrophils, 29% lymphocytes, 21% monocytes. And then you can give them the retics if you have it. Um, the reticulocyte count was 1.8. The absolute count was 0 0.056. Um, for a retic index of 1.0. Okay, why don't we pause there because there's a lot going on with him. 
Um, Dr. Saif, I'm sure you've taught this to me multiple times before and in your lectures I've heard it, but I always get confused with the reticulous site indices and the counts and the absolutes and when to use what. Do you mind walking through how you interpret those labs and what, what is important for you as a hematologist when people call you and also just as an intern is what we should know? Yeah, um, so I mean, what someone in the chat said pencilopenia with hypoproliferative marrow. So yeah, I love the reticulocyte count and I think you all are kind of getting increasingly proficient in sending it even before Adela asks you to send it. Uh, but usually I go by the absolute count. Um, again, the reticulocyte index is a measure of, uh, you know, how high the reticulocyte count should be given the degree of anemia. So it is one which does tell you that it is a hypoproliferative marrow. But just because I look at the count so much, I, I like looking at the absolute number. Um, and uh, 0 0.056 is a very, very low number. So um, although the, the, the percentage may be 1.8%, which may still be in the normal range, the absolute count is very, very low. Um, so, and again, you know, just because we look at our sickle cell patients so much, and um, sometimes, you know, in a few Jehovah's Witness patients, our bone marrow has a remarkable capability of increasing the production of reticulocytes in setting of an acute blood loss or consumption, um, if need be, if the marrow is robust enough. So again, you know, 0 0.056 is a very low number. It's something where, you know, maybe you should think about parvo too, although it's never parvo, but you know, um, yeah, it's just like a really, really hypoproliferative marrow. Yeah, and how about the, the diff on the white blood cells? I'm used so, to just seeing neutrophils be neutrophils and then never really seeing yeah. neutrophils being involved. So I would say because, the, I mean, I also don't necessarily look at the percent percentages, I like to look at the absolute counts. So like absolute neutrophil count, because sometimes percentages may be, um, so the 29% lymphocyte or 21% monocyte looks high. But if you look at the absolute number, it may actually be normal because the white cell count itself is very low. So, um, but yeah, it's kind of, this is not a good differential. It should be mostly neutrophils. And I don't like monocytes because a lot of times what the lab labels as monocytes can also be, you know, blast forms and all that stuff. So be very suspicious of monocytosis. Mm -hmm. so you repeat the MCV? Uh, we have a debate in the chat. It was MCV. normal. MCV was 96. Mm -hmm. 96. Oh, okay. okay. That's what happens if you get demented, you don't hear, hear the numbers right. <laughs> Dr. Centaur, you love the BMP. Uh, yeah, so, so this, this patient uh, has really high BUN and uh, creatinine compared to where he was. Um, now, given his history, uh, I think there are two things that we have to worry about. Uh, the first is obstruction, um, and that in particular, because that in particular causes hyperkalemia. And so I would be very suspicious of outlet obstruction in this guy. Maybe both outlet obstruction and volume contraction. Uh, he is hydrated. So uh, his anion gap is a bit high, but I bet his phosphate's going to be high. But what I'm wondering, and and uh, this this is a question for Dr. Saif is. Even with acute with an acute kidney uh, injury, uh, and and this may resolve just by putting in a catheter and giving some fluids, could that could that lead to decreased EPO, and could that be a reason for the low reticulocyte count? I wouldn't think so. So his numbers are like his numbers are bad enough for us to consider some more testing and maybe, you know, looking what's going on in the bone marrow. Um, again, erythropoietin uh, production does decrease as, you know, uh, the renal function progresses. Um, but if this is an AKI, then, um, you know, I mean, his hemoglobin is also 10.6, so it's not, not that bad, but the platelets and the white blood cell count worries me. Well, his hemoglobin is going to go down because he's profoundly dehydrated. His oh, yeah. is 147. So I, I bet his hemoglobin is really around eight or nine. Yeah. After we give him fluids and we're going to give him fluids, 
But the first thing I do is make sure he's not obstructed because, mm -hmm. I, and, and this is this is my the one pearl I'm going to throw out today. Uh, obstructive uropathy often presents with hyperkalemia, and mm -hmm. it is it is uh, and as a matter of fact the one we just did on AKI with Joel Toff two weeks ago. We had a discussion. It's technically not a type four RTA, but most people call it a type four RTA. Mm -hmm. And not everybody's obstruction has it, but uh, um, I think that th that that needs to be resolved. That may be part of why he's so altered. Um, but then we get to really work on the hematological problems, which uh, I can. I think we can take care of the left-hand side of the labs, and you're gonna to have to tell us how to take care of the right-hand side of the labs. Agree. Um, do we have a calcium? Uh, we do. The calcium was low. It was oh, seven, one second, sorry. Okay, so he was in a hypercalcemic. Yeah. Correct, yeah. So if you're gonna give the calcium, you're gonna to need to give the albumin and the phosphate also, if you happen to have those. The phos was 8.8. .8. Right, and that, that probably explains his anion gap. Uh, most of the time when you see a picture like this, and so he has an, his anion gap is 17, you could predict he's gonna have a high phosphate. Again, that might go away with, with volume expansion and if he's obstructed. I'm, I'm not convinced that this is progression of kidney disease. Mm -hmm. And then the, the calcium was 7.8 and the albumin was uh, uh, 3.6. So. That's amazing. Okay. What other, so at this point, you've gotten this information, Nick, he was paged up to you from our emergency medicine colleagues. What other labs initially did you guys get or what did you order? Do yeah, we so have total protein? Like you gave albumin, was there a protein gap? Uh, the, there was not, the total protein was 7.1. Okay. And I can just round out the rest of the, um, yeah. like the AST was uh, 247, ALT was 205. And then ALK FOSS was uh, 261. Um, right, so um, this, the, I was actually in the ICU uh, when this patient was admitted. He was signed out to me in the morning. Um, but additional initial labs that we thought were probably pertinent were uh, uh, haptoglobin, which was less than 10, uh, and LDH. Uh, which was 482. I think I saw in the chat um, wondering about B12, folate, and copper. The copper was within normal limits at 1.16. B12 was greater than 2,000. The folate was greater than 20. Um, and then coags, his INR was 1.7. PTT was 45. We also got a fibrinogen, which was 70, and a D-dimer, which was uh, 5,843. And then um, with his volume overload, and uh, as we, we've noted, uh, difficult to manage volume status. We also, in cardiac history, we got a BNP, uh, which was elevated to 111,000, uh, which, yeah, I, again, I guess take with a grain of salt in the setting of his kidney injury, but uh, it was 30,000 at the last check. Do you have a billy? His total billy was 1.2. Um, we did not initially have a direct that was obtained, um, but there was one that was obtained a couple of days later, which was around 50% of the total. So now we're having some hemolysis labs to, to talk about along with some workup, initial workup for his pancytopenia. Um, before we get into the details of this, Dr. Seif, we order B12 a lot. We order folate a lot. I feel like copper is now climbing the ladder as number three is a common one that we order. When What is your threshold to actually work up 
pancytopenia with B12 and folate? Are we order over ordering it or are we doing it appropriately or are we under ordering it? I, I do think that, um, I think it's appropriate to order. These tests are such low hanging fruit. And I would say um, it's not uncommon for us to find people with folate deficiency or B12 deficiency. Um, so, so I would say that you're trying to work up a pancytopenia situation, um, you know, I always say try to get as much information from the peripheral blood as we can before we think of like doing a marrow. Um, so so I, I do think, yeah, I think we order it appropriately. I think retic, hapto, LDH, copper, B12, and folate helps. Um, do you know why um, his uh, B12 may be more than 2,000? So B12 is an acute phase reactant um, and um, it can, yes, and liver injury too, exactly. So it can be kind of falsely elevated or can be undetectably high in someone who's acutely inflamed or has liver injury. Um, and, and then again, I, I don't believe like he had a low B12 before and now it's all elevated because of liver injury because, you know, we don't see macrocytosis um, on the MCV to suggest that, but just to kind of, um, keep that in mind. I also want to mention that although haptoglobin is a good marker for hemolysis, very frequently it can become undetectable because, um, you know, you just gave someone a transfusion. Um, sometimes the RBC units are frozen and sometimes that mild hemolysis within a unit that you transfused can make someone's haptoglobin become undetectable. So we all talk about like how, uh, was the haptoglobin checked before transfusion or after? Um, and then again, you know, it's made in the liver. So if there is a concern for synthetic deficiency, it can go down too. So yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm very convinced that there is an evidence of hemolysis yet without looking at the smear. Yeah. And um, with, with all this, the, the liver, enzyme elevations, his clinical picture, and his what looks like subacute kidney injury, does any condition come to mind when if you were consulted on this patient? Or is there like a differential you're running through in your head right now? So, I mean, um, I, 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 I don't know if I'm very um, impressed by the, by the liver injury that per se, like, you know, maybe, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's high, but it's not that high. Like his belly is fine. Um, and yes, sure, his INR is a little high, um, but um, but I would say that if I see pancytopenia and AKI, I, I think of a plasma cell dyscrasia first. Like I would like to know what the light chains and all that is because those patients can present with like a very severe AKI situation. Um, yeah. Yeah. Are there, are there any conditions where you get um, hemolysis plus kidney injury that the listener should be aware about? So someone talked about atypical HUS, um, but, but then again, you know, unless it's a combination of like, why is, why is he so myelosuppressed? I would say most of the patients with atypical HUS present with um, very profound renal injury and nothing else. Like they are not people who present with alter mental status. Um, um, again, you know, you can think about not just atypical HUS, like you can think about TTB part I mean, he's older, he's anemic. Um, but um, but those, those patients, usually that is their presentation. I am bruising, I'm altered. Um, and or I am bruising and I have a creatinine of seven when I was completely normal. So this seems less likely. And also in both of those patients, their reticulocyte count should be high, right? I mean, you're having microangiopathic hemolysis. You shouldn't have myelosuppression. Dr. Centaur? Yeah. Uh, I'm... Uh... I had just asked for the CK because I thought maybe the transaminases could be elevated because of uh, the fact that he wasn't moving around and probably had mild uh, uh, myoglobin. Uh, I don't think that's why. I, anybody who's ever rounded with me and Natasha has, I would I would fix the fix what's what's going on uh, on the left side uh, while. Mm -hmm. 
we're collecting the data on the right side. Uh, but I agree with the people in the chat. I, he's gonna. I think we're gonna end up doing a bone marrow. I don't. I don't know yeah. how to get around that. Is uh, Doctor Safe? Is that? Is that? Uh, yes. Is that, I, that yeah. how, you do, how you how you go about this? Because this is sort of weird. It looks like we have hemolysis, but but it looks like we have suppressed marrow, and now we're really in a mess. Is this a myelophysic process? Um, again, you know, looking at the smear would be helpful. Like it would help if you see nucleated reds or teardrops. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I cannot explain the the renal injury part, but uh, but it sounds like there is something going on there in the marrow that apparently none of the testing that we've done so far is revealing a cause for. All right, next. Slide. Uh, APM APML, that, that's, a good, that's a good thought. Um, a lot of patients with APML can present with like, you know, mild leukopenia, um, mild anemia or thrombocytopenia, and they can have like a DIC-like picture. But the AKI is also very really unusual. So. so Nick, I know in your ICU, you had plenty of time. You collected the smear yourself. You walked over to the middle of campus, went to the lab, looked it over, called Dr. Saif herself and said, this is what I saw on the smear. <laughs> that's, exa that's exactly right, Mohit, as I always do. <laughs> um, so the, the smear showed one to two schistocytes per high-powered field. It also showed elliptocytes, target cells, echinocytes, a number of other things that... Uh, like anisocytosis, mm -hmm. oikulocytosis, like pretty, I think, non-specific. Um, and yeah, I think that's all from the smear to comment on. No atypical like lymphocytes were commented on or anything else uh, useful. Okay, so Dr. Seif, I see one schisto on the smear. Should I immediately say, oh my gosh, we have hemolysis? We've solved the case. No, no, um, yeah, I wouldn't. Um, yeah, I think I think one to two schistocyte is uh, well. I mean, we always joke when I want this to be TTP, I can see enough schistocytes to make the call. But honestly, I, I think it's it's all about the clinical picture part of it. So me and Adela always joke around that. You know, it's just like when the clinical picture is is like that then you know the smear starts looking like that too but but again yeah i mean i think schistocytes are there sure but i but i still feel like it doesn't explain i i don't feel this is microangiopathic hemolysis um or like you know enough of a situation where you would send adamts 13 or yeah so would you, at this point you see this patient, would you be recommending to the team to get a bone marrow biopsy to further elucidate what's going on? I would say that I would want myeloma labs at least. And then again, you know, some, I, I love that time is very telling. So, you know, someone comes in, you're going to put maybe a line to dialyze them and it would give us a few days to kind of trend their counts, which is very helpful for us one way or another. Um, but yeah, if, if, you know, three, four days down the road, this is exactly where he is, then yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll think about, uh, also imaging, like, you know, is his spleen big, is his liver big? Yeah. Are you, yeah. You know, if he is an alcohol induced portal hypertension situation and his spleen is like, you know, 20 centimeters, then yeah, half of his cells may be there. Well, Nick, I don't know how much more diagnostic workup you have. I know you had a lot that you shared with me, but any pertinent ones that you want to share before you get to uh, the last aliquot? I can try to comment on some of the things that uh, Dr. Seif just mentioned there. So we did a right upper quadrant ultrasound, which showed evidence of uh, hepatic congestion, but no comments on um, surface nodularity or anything like mm -hmm. that. He, he did have spleen imaging, not at time of presentation, but um, around the time, like shortly thereafter, um, that ultimately showed a normal size spleen. Um, uh, what else have folks mentioned here? Uh, we did a pretty extensive infectious workup, all of which came back unremarkable. Um, 
and I've been trying to sort of peek at the chat from time to time. I don't think we, if the ED did an initial bladder scan, he had a fully placed in the ED. Um, I'm not sure what the bladder scan showed. He did ultimately get a renal ultrasound, which showed increased echogenicity bilaterally, uh, but no hydro. I think that was after, I mean, that, that was uh, later in the, like after his Foley was removed and his mental status was, was improving somewhat. Does, does cranium come down with the Foley? It did. Uh, I don't remember the um, chronicity of the decline, but it did improve um, over the, yeah, following Foley placement. Um, and I think those are the main things. Um, so yeah, I can sort of go ahead and give the next steps. This is fascinating. I was a little bit, I was feeling to, to be honest, feeling a little bit insecure about presenting this just because, uh, um, I wasn't, I still don't know if we had a great handle on exactly what was going on, uh, with this guy. Uh, but it's been, it's fun listening to you guys and learning from you all. Um, but essentially overnight with the mental status, uh, mental status changes, the one to two schistocytes and the, uh, AKI liver numbers, he, his plasmic score ended up being high enough that they thought it warranted, uh, a plex overnight. So he, he did get plex, uh, for possible TTP. We did send the Adam TS 13, which came back uh, at 24%, which was inconsistent with TTP. Um, and so he was no longer, uh, we discontinued Plex after that. The thinking at the time then following the, the return of that Adam TS 13 lab uh, was that there was concern for a possible atypical HUS. Uh, and so he got, uh, ultimately got a dose of eculizumab um, and all of this was before, oh, the, all of this was before the, uh, the bone marrow biopsy got done and came back. Um, so that's a little bit of his initial course. He sort of slowly improved with, with some supportive care and was transferred out of the ICU after four or five days. Um, Mohit, I, should, should I pause here for? Uh, yeah, I think this is a good time maybe for Dr. Saif to comment on the plasmic score because maybe not everyone is familiar with that. I know I've used it in practice with the hematology group before and have been wrong before, but I think that erring on the side of precaution is always better. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, again, I, oh gosh, I do so much in patient so I sometimes, <laughs> you know, this is just like you, you learn uh, by doing, right? So how many times do I get a call from my fellow saying, this is the story and I have to make that judgment call at midnight or 2 a.m. Do I feel comfortable placing a pharesis catheter in someone with such low platelet number? Um, and again, you know, would me not doing plasma pharesis would hurt someone? So, um, so yeah, so plasmic score is again, um, you know, a platelet count of less than 30 will give you a score. So again, in most of the patients, TTP is um, more profound thrombocytopenia. So if your platelet is count is less than one, um, less than 30, you get one point. If you have like markers of hemolysis, so again, the reticulocyte count is high. The indirect bilirubin is um, elevated. Um, you get a point for that. Um, and then um, you get a point for the MCV, which is less than um, 90. Um, you get a point for history of, um, no, actually you get a point deducted for solid organ or stem cell transplant. You get point deducted for active cancer. And you get a point if the INR is less than 1.5. And um, if your creatinine is less than two, you get a point as well. So in general, what the thought process is that in the, 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 uh, the idiopathic TTP with ADMTS 13 of less than 10%, um, which is, it's called plasmic score. You can like look it up. It's like, um, um, you can find an online calculators for it, but um, all the, um, um, the things that we're talking about, the thrombocytopenia, um, the hemolysis, the active cancer, the solid history of solid organ or stem cell transplant is telling you how likely um, this person has the idiopathic kind. So cancer can cause um, a malignancy-induced TTP, which we don't do plasmapheresis for, which does not respond to it. Um, and also the solid organ or stem cell transplant patients can get this 
transplant related TTP, which again does not respond to it. So again, if they have that history, you won't get a score for it. Um, and then, um, and then uh, you know, the creatinine also, um, most of the patients with TTP would have a creatinine of two or less. So um, if you have a very profound creatinine elevation like this patient, I would think about atypical HUS. If, if you know the clinical suspicion was high enough, never say never, because I did have a patient with TTP who had a creatinine of nine, but, uh, but then again, you know, just talking about how you can make kind of a, a judgmental call at midnight in regards to plasma paresis or not. But again, you know, for, for me, just looking at this person, and I don't know if I was on service for this one, but, uh, but my, my, I would have thought the likelihood was less, but I still feel like if you are suspicious enough, please uh, call us and, you know, it's, it's much more easier to do plasma phoresis and kind of, you know, have a normal MTS 13 come by later than other, you know, the other way around. Absolutely. Yeah. For, for those of you who don't know Dr. Saif, she basically runs our inpatient consults 24 <laughs> <24/7. laughs> seven. Yeah. I'm very much frequently on service. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Centaur, do you have any insight or, or thoughts with everything that Nick has presented so far? Yeah, the, the only thought, and I've, I've tried to say this several times, is before we try to combine the kidney and uh, the hematology problem, we need to see, is, it really a, uh, is this really a new kidney injury? And that's why I kept on asking about the obstruction, because this look because of the hyperkalemia. Now, this is important for the take-home points. Not everybody with obstructive AKI gets hyperkalemia, but some people do. And to have mm -hmm. that much hyperkalemia at this point uh, pointed towards obstructive uh, uh, uropathy. And if that resolves the, the, the renal problem, um, then I think we're less likely to have to try to put together a combined kidney uh, hematology problem, and we can look at the hematology by mm -hmm. itself. And I think that's really important is to think about the, the kidney with this creatinine is to think about obstruction to, to con and think about volume. The other thing that, that I was really, uh, I'm really concerned about with, with the elevated JVP and the liver test is this mostly right-sided heart failure because we didn't get anything going for left-sided heart failure, we didn't really uh, have a, uh, any, any uh, breathing problems. Um, so uh, I think our, that we can look at the hematology alone and, that, and I think that's what everybody's been really, that's where we really should go. Yeah, and I, you, you bring up a great point that we always like to bring up Occam's razor, but we shouldn't anchor on it too early. And majority of the time, patients will have multiple processes going on that aren't necessarily interconnected. Yeah, Hickam was a pretty smart dude. Yeah, Hickam's dictum, yeah. <laughs> um, Nick, what else do you have? We have about 10 minutes left for the final diagnosis and, and final thoughts. We do have myeloma, right? Stuff checked and it was fine. Like, it, was eventually, like, it, it was eventually checked and it was fine, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I can go ahead and I, I apologize in advance. This will not be the most satisfying uh, landing of the plane, but um, eventually the patient did get a bone marrow biopsy, uh, which showed hypocellular marrow with erythroid predominance and serous atrophy, which Dr. Seif, I would love, if that is useful at all diagnostically, would love uh, your insight on. It also showed diminished iron stores, um, no reticulin fibrosis, the flow was uh, too dilute, uh, so it was listed as negative, non-contributory. He also eventually got um, PNH flow, which was negative. Um, I'm, I don't think there was much else interesting uh, to report on, but essentially, in the end, the patient was ultimately diagnosed with multifactorial pancytopenia in the setting of severe malnutrition, uh, likely previous, at least, chronic ethanol use um, what became ESRD, uh, and then iron deficiency anemia, which I, I did not give the iron labs yet, I don't think. Um, he also subsequently developed a, a GI bleed, um, 
and had never underwent a, a colonoscopy. So there was some thought that potentially, and, and um, it also sort of in looking back through this, uh, it, adenocarcinomas, I, I believe, can potentially present with DIC, which some of his initial labs, if I would also be excited for you guys to comment on this, sort of looked DIC-ish um, with the fibrinogen and the platelets and the D-dimer. Um, so that, that was another thought of what could potentially be going on. The nephrologist ultimately wanted uh, to review a, a renal biopsy after he developed uh, ESRD, which was following this admission, um, but unfortunately due to the comorbidities that, that was never obtained. Uh, and unfortunately as well, uh, we have abdominal imaging, which was showed no sign of malignancy, um, but we did not ever uh, obtain a colonoscopy. And what about um, the uh, hemolysis workup? I know he was admitted a couple times after you saw him, what ultimately came Yeah, out? so the um, hemolysis, as Dr. Seif uh, sort of hinted at initially, was ultimately attributed to mechanical hemolysis related to the, the bioprosthetic aortic valve. So this, in the end, was more of a case where we uh, we thought Hickam's dictum prevailed. Um, but I would be curious if uh, I have not been checking the chat super recently. But if there's anything else you guys see, unfortunately, the patient um, ended up passing away three months after this admission. Um, so if there's anything else we missed or anything else you guys see that warranted consideration, I would love to to learn from you. Dr. Saif, I saw some interesting facial expressions when... Yes, so you said his marrow showed serous atrophy? That was what was listed in the, in the PATH report. Oh. Which is like, I just Googled it up because I've never had that mentioned, but apparently this is like severe marrow um, hypoplasia from anorexia nervo nervosa and cachexia. Um, so, um, so I mean, uh, yeah, sure, maybe the BMI and the cachexia was the reason for this because, I mean, in general, I have never seen that comment made ever. Um, but there are like some case reports of um, patients with scurvy or endocrine disorders or massive weight loss after bariatric surgery who um, had like an MRI signal and then eventually a marrow that showed this serous atrophy of the bone marrow. Very interesting. You know, I actually learned this today. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, very frequently, whenever we do bone marrows on inpatients, this is what we find, some kind of a hypoplastic marrow and then nothing uh, surprising. So so again, I, um, I sometimes kind of say, let's see how things look like a week or two weeks after discharge. And then we will see which way to go. Um, you know, it didn't show any myeloid malignancy. We we can do like myelosec testing to like look deeper, but but I don't believe we were going to find much in the marrow per se. Um, yeah, that's very non satisfying. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> the, also, I should have mentioned the atypical HUS uh, compliment panel was sent, and that was negative. Okay, um, so I that as well. Um, in the studies for eculizumab, one third of the patients who responded to the drug uh, did not have any complement-related gene mutations or any mutations in the complement uh, panel. So hence, you can get eculizumab and can get it approved as an outpatient without the need for documentation. And so if the clinical suspicion is high enough, I would say ask for eculizumab, give it as soon as you can. You can get those patients off of dialysis and then we just continue as an outpatient for indefinite period without, um, it's a very expensive drug in the period with any test that tells you whether or not they have it. But, you know, um, we've had some remarkable um, salvage of renal function. Again, that's not usually how they present though, you know. <laughs> Nick, did, did you do any testing for lupus? Yeah, he did get, well, he got the um, APLA panel, which was negative, and then an ANA, which was 1 to 80, and um, the double-stranded DNA antibody was negative. Okay, and and j just to remind everybody that uh, hydralazine does cause drug-induced lupus. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we used to, back in the 70s, when we first started using hydralazine for heart failure, we would see a lot of it, but we were using much higher doses usually 
but uh, always keep that uh, in the back of your mind in someone with hydralazine is that it, it can cause really significant drug-induced lupus. Mm -hmm. And one question I had for Dr. Sive. So if you get a patient like this who the bone marrow biopsy is not really all that specific for anything, say the serous atrophy wasn't there, and it was this kind of unrevealing biopsy, what is your threshold for waiting a while, seeing if the counts stay the way they are, and then rebiopsying? Is there any utility in rebiopsying? I, I, I wouldn't. Um, again, you know, unless there, there was like dysplasia or something that I wanted to look back at, I, I, I feel like, you know, Meru gave us enough information. Um, either the counts will get better on their own. And this was just some kind of a infection induced myelosuppression or drug induced myelosuppression or, um, or, you know, the myelosec testing or the cytogenetics would be more revealing um, in terms of an underlying myeloid pathology. That makes sense. Nick, yeah. After reviewing this case and having it in real life, was there any takeaways that you wanted to share with the group or any, anything that you kind of realized as you built this case for tonight? I think initially when I learned about the plasmic score, um, it was just a, uh, I have buzzword associations for what TTP is. Um, so I think this was just a reminder, like Dr. Seif pointed out, the degree of creatinine elevation in true TTP is usually not very impressive with, with some exceptions. But I think learning that these associations that I have, um, there, there, there's often more, but my, my buzzword uh, associations are not adequate all the time for uh, really managing patients well. Um, so that I, if nothing else, that was motivation to, to continue, continue learning. I had one other uh, nice take home point um, that I should have written down because I cannot remember it right now, but so I guess that's it for now. Um, and then my one last question for Dr. Seif too, if we have time, Dr. Seif, if you were explaining myelo, myeloseq testing to someone, hypothetically speaking, who could not adequately explain what that is, what, what would you say that is? <laughs> Talking about yourself. <laughs> I, yeah, that was the best question ever. Yes. So yeah, it's a sequencing panel, um, a myeloid um, sequencing panel that checks for 46 different gene signals. Um, it's run um, in-house at WashU. Um, the good thing about sending it um, inpatient is that a lot of times you don't need to depend on patient's insurance because a lot of insurance companies won't pay for it. Um, but, um, but, you know, it's just 46 different gene signals, which can tell us about an MPN, um, an EML, an MDS. Um, we talk about CCAS, like clonal cytopenia of undetermined significance, uh, which again, if you're able to document on the sequencing panel, you can get, you know, hypomethylating agents approved for some patients. Um, and so it's also, it's good for diagnosis and it's also good for like, you know, getting a treatment approved. Um, takes uh, four to six weeks to come back and can also be sent on peripheral blood. So it doesn't have to be on the marrow. Dr. Centaur, I was hoping that you could comment a little bit about mechanical hemolysis because you've kind of grown through the ages of all the various valves that we've placed in people. Yeah, we saw a lot more before we had bioprosthetic valves. Mm -hmm. That's about all I can say. Um, I have many weaknesses in medicine and uh, hemolysis is one of them. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I don't like hemolysis. Well, great. Yeah. Unless it's something really cool, like uh, uh, one of the very first patients that was ever presented to me um, at, uh, when, in 1980, when, my first month of attending, most of you weren't born, um, they presented a lady who came in with severe shortness of breath. And after we went through the differential, she turned out she had a hemoglobin of three. Mm -hmm. And we made the diagnosis because 12 hours later, they couldn't uh, cross match her blood. Yes. So she, she, had, she had cold autoimmune hemolysis. That yeah. was extraordinarily interesting. Uh, not a great diagnosis in 1980, but... Uh, um, mm -hmm. Those are interesting, but a lot of times I'm totally befuddled and I've been befuddled for the last hour. <laughs> <laughs> it 
this is why I kept on talking about the kidneys because I know something about the kidneys. <laughs> well, Dr. Centaur, Dr. Saif, Nick, thank you all so much for taking the time this evening. Um, I hope everyone in the chat, I didn't get a chance to look through, but it seems like as usual, the chat was on fire with a lot of great thoughts and pearls. Um, thanks again, everyone. All right, thank you.